You're watching Global Trade This Week with Pete Mento and Doug Draper. Okay, welcome to another edition of Global Trade This Week. We come to you every single week. And uh, my name is Doug Draper. I'm one of your hosts and the other host is on the other side of the United States, usually in New Hampshire. Uh, live free or die, as they say out there, but it is Pete Mento, my good friend. Pete, how are you doing today on this edition of Global Trade? I'm great, buddy. I'm great. And I am in New Hampshire. Uh, live free or die. It's uh, exciting to be home. Nice. Very cool. So we didn't talk about this uh, uh, before the show, but I know you were doing some um, tours yesterday uh, with some colleges. How did that go? It went well. You know, my, my daughter... Um, my daughter is dragging me to a bunch of different colleges. I went to an all women's university yesterday, which was pretty impressive. I'd never thought that I'd have a kid that considered one, but uh, it was it was actually pretty impressive the way they looked at the education. Um, visited a predominantly, uh, I guess, arts based school. My daughter wants to be a writer, so I'll be paying her rent forever. But um, you know, most of the schools that we go to are very artsy based. So mm -hmm. um, we'll be seeing a lot more. So she plans on visiting some schools in Canada, uh, a couple wow. in Florida. So we'll be looking all over the place. Yes. Dollar signs above your head. I can see them. I can see them. Uh, so. Yeah. <laughs> Lucky me, Doug. Yeah. Yeah. So I can't get any of these kids to go to boat school, you know, just go to see <laughs> what I say or trade schools. So, yeah. well, hey, um, speaking of schools, we got to bring uh, our school and our knowledge to our listeners. So uh, let's just jump into this bad boy. I let off, so you get the first topic. Yeah, uh, this is a fun topic in that it's it's something that people are watching sort of um, almost like it's a, a HBO drama. And that is the breakup of the alliance between MSC and Maersk which I believe we've talked about a couple of times at this mm -hmm. point. I think you brought it up the first time. And the uh, breakup of MSC and Maersk is timely in that you have the, the, the great reduction in cost on rates that's happening ever since the, the pandemic changes have, uh, have, have lessened. And they've gone their separate ways. Not a big deal, right? So you, you figure a partnership of this type and the code sharing, as it were, of this type, not that big a deal. What is the big deal is that these two behemoths, these two massive companies, MSC has the most tonnage now. Uh, it actually dethroned Maersk to become mm. the largest shipping company. They're going in a very different direction than Maersk. So now these two different companies, which were sort of of a like mind and operation, are setting themselves up strategically to go after the future of their business in a very different way. Maersk has taken a look at the global landscape for transportation. And uh, as again, we've talked a lot about on this show, invested a, a lot of money in logistics firms, 4PLs, customs house brokerage, technology. They've really gone into services because they see it as an opportunity to create a more stable environment for profit. You know, ocean rates go up and down and um, they're going to be in a position now, hopefully, to be able to sell inland rates, air freight, boarding services, warehousing, PO management, going more deeper into the supply chain. Mm -hmm. MSC is doubling down on being a massive carrier and saying, we're going to have so much space, so much capacity. We're going to serve so much of the globe that we're going to be a lower cost option, which is going to attract BCOs. So we're, we're just gonna maintain the ability to keep that business. And it's in the long run, it's gonna be better for us. Two very different ways of doing business as an ocean carrier. And honestly, man, Hapag Lloyd's kind of going in the same direction. So MSC and Hapag Lloyd are going one way. And then you have you know Maersk, who's very much going in a different one. It, CMA mm -hmm. going in a very different one. The list goes on and on. So this seems to be the, the the fork in the road where ocean carriers are making a decision about what the next 20 to 50 years are going to look like. And it's going to be interesting from our perspective to get to watch it. Yeah. Yeah. When this when we first talked about this, um, <clears throat> we a couple things come to mind, right? 
owning the rails uh, as far as the supply chain, soup the nuts, farm the table, all that kind of good stuff and all those fancy uh, fun terms. But yeah, I think that the one of the terms I heard was land side, land side logistics. And, and you, you just put it very succinctly, they're, they're selling services. The unique thing here is that they're selling services to the end customer where MSC is selling services to service providers, right? And um, being in on this side and on the sales side my whole career, the noise level that you have when you sell services to service providers is so much smaller than going direct to consumers because of the demands, which I totally get. They both have their pros and the cons. And Maersk has the deep pockets to uh, you know, expand their reach beyond uh, beyond the steamship line into all the other different services. So they got the money. Um, they want to integrate, uh, own the rail, so to speak. There's a lot of competition out there, right? You just you wonder how much money are they going to throw at it in order to, um, to get their foothold into that market. And then MSC, like you said, they're doubling down and they're like, hey, we're just going to make our ships efficient. Um, we're going to look for ways to streamline and we're going to stay in our lane and, um, you know, just provide, uh, you know, the one leg of the supply chain. So I, if you had to pick and there's not a winner and a loser because it's all to be determined, but a post-COVID, yes, ocean freight's a little bit crazy right now. The rates are very, very low. But you've seen it in all kinds of industries. When push comes to shove and things get crazy, you contract and you focus on your core competency. And that's what MSC is doing, where Maersk is, is doing the opposite. I guess if I had to say who right here and now in 2023 has a better strategy, I would probably say MSC. There's just a tremendous amount of competition and a lot of money that's going to be expend uh, uh, to, um, to have that outreach. So it'll be interesting. But if there's a company that could do it, I would say it would be Maersk. They got a lot of cash. And uh, if they got a good strategy, then more power to them. I'll be interested to watch, man. I, I, I couldn't predict if I, if I, even if I had a lot more information, which is what I would need. But uh, everyone's being told to diversify at this point, which is clearly what, MS, what uh, Maersk is doing. But then again, you said so much of our industry, look at what FedEx is doing, what UPS is doing, is really doubling down on just what you're great at. Mm -hmm. So it's um, it's it's definitely two distinct businesses doing what appears to be the the recipe of the day these days. So it'll yeah. be fun to watch, man. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, well, we're gonna for my topic, we're gonna stick with the uh, the ocean freight, and um, this is something that's been happening um, for a little while, and it's starting to get a little attention. I read about it, uh, I think, last week, but um, there are. Uh, canal water restrictions going on down in, in Panama on the Panama Canal. Um, apparently, it's one of the worst droughts since the 1950s. Um, it's a mother nature. It has nothing to do with the, the, the finances and what's impacting it. It has simply to do with weather. You could spin it, and we're not going to go down a wormhole with um, uh, you know global warming or environmental impacts. I'm simply here to say that Water levels are down. That means there's less weight, less containers are, uh, that can be put on a vessel to move through there. Um, if the water's down, you can only depress it so so much before you hit bottom, so to speak. So the question here is, um, is this drought in this situation, how long is it going to be? How much of an impact is it going to be? Because you can only jam so many uh, vessels through that port when the water is low. Is it going to be substantial enough to have any type of ripple effect now that it's become more popular to bring your products around to the East Coast and get rid of the chaos um, that was in Los Angeles, now that uh, LA and Long Beach, now that's subsided a little bit. But um, you can't pivot immediately. And there's lots of routings and lots of companies that said that's not, you know, uh, it's not going to happen to us again. Let's get this stuff to the East Coast. So there's more volume through going through the canal. The water level is lower. There's only so much throughput that you can manage at that time. So it hasn't gotten a lot of attention. I've seen a couple articles on it. Um, so the question to you and the, the feedback, is it going to be a blip and nobody's going to really pay attention? Or is it going to be a substantial enough impact that we're going to start seeing delays, um, cost increases to mitigate what's going on down there? 
I, I can see both sides of, of the equation, but it's just interesting. And there is no fix. There's nobody to blame. Um, I mean, you could get super, go up the food chain and say, well, we are all to blame because of putting more carbon in the air and all that kind of stuff. That's for a different podcast. But uh, I don't know. Have you heard about it, Pete? Is it a big enough blip to, to really uh, be concerned about? Well, if there's any good news, buddy, it's that volumes are down. Um, so I think that you're, you're going to see because of the cost of operating to the East Coast, as much as the East Coast has enjoyed an increase in volume, mm -hmm. it's more profitable to operate to the West Coast. So I, 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 I don't know how else to put this to consumers, but whether they like it or not, they're going to be using Long Beach again. So that's part of this. Second of all, transiting the Panama Canal, which I did as a young man, um, it, it's not it's not as technically advanced and as glamorous as you think. There's a reason why they call the Suez Canal and the Panama Canal the, the trench and the ditch. I mean, they they literally like they they dug they they dug like a hole through a country. I mean, they, there's and then they they've got locks that you go through. And it's the most low tech crap you've ever seen. There's no water, there's no ships. And if you don't have enough flow state to go through those things, you're putting the vessel in the canal in danger. So it could slow it down, but I think volume is going to be low enough, Doug, that it's not going to be, it's going to be noticeable, but it's not going to be an emergency. Mm -hmm. I think one way or the other, you're going to see tonnage being pushed off to different services right now. I don't think it's really going to be that big of a negative effect. It's an excellent lesson, though. It's an excellent last lesson in the importance of the canal, how we need to continue to modernize it, and how important it was that we recently did, and how we need to continue to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. All right. Well, um, oftentimes one of the most entertaining times of our show, which is halftime, to brought who? to us. To who? Brought, what? What? To who is it most entertaining, Doug? Um, you well, you, you love, you love halftime. Be, because most of the most of the comments I make on the LinkedIn, the first thing is the is the uh, the comments that have nothing to do with our industry uh, that we talk about at halftime. So to me, it's to me and hopefully our audience. So, right. but well, I hope we your would, sponsor loves it. What's that? I hope that our sponsor loves it. Yeah. Well. I think Keenan's sitting back and enjoying life in Breckenridge during this uh, during this uh, this show. So uh, hopefully he will. Maybe he hasn't uh, jumped on his bike yet to uh, do a mountain bike. But I'm glad you brought him up because Cap Logistics puts this thing together. They're the ones that bring us halftime, and uh, we're excited because it gives us the platform and the soapbox to get up and talk about whatever the heck we want. So uh, with that being said, what uh, who wants to jump in on this one? You or me? Oh, I'll, I'll go first, Doug. Let's just get it out of the <laughs> I figured, way. I figured as yeah. much with your topic. <laughs> yeah, so I uh, I am absolutely enraptured at the idea of this Zuckerberg-Musk cage fight. So <laughs> the idea that two of the richest men on planet Earth would actually just even consider, even if it's, a, even if it's not a, a joke at the high, if it's just kind of possible, mm -hmm. that these two would consider stripping down to their underwear and putting on like what three ounce gloves and pretending to try to hurt each other for three, two minute rounds. What a time to be alive, Doug. <laughs> um, you know, because I'm sure that there are many people who would love to see the Facebook guy get beat up. And there's a lot of people who'd love to see the, the Tesla guy get beat up or the Twitter guy. I don't know. For me as a lifelong, absolute obsessed person with combat sports. This is fantastic. Um, so first of all, I have a couple of questions, Doug. Would you watch it? If this does happen, would you watch it? Would you pay to watch it is question number two. Mm. And if it happens, who you got? Um, no, no. And probably Zuckerberg. And yeah. I, okay. I, I think he's just, first of all, Elon Musk in, in any pictures you've seen looks a little bit doughy and out of shape. And I think uh, Zuckerberg <laughs> could come in 
with a shiv or something and just take it out real quick. The fight would be quick because he'd play a little dirty or come up with something that would take him out pretty fast. So, no, I wouldn't watch it. No, I wouldn't pay for it. And uh, I'll take Zuckerberg. I would, I would, I can't wait to watch it. I might, if it's like, I would probably take the week off beforehand to pre-drink. <laughs> I'd be so excited. I, I would actually try to see it live. So if they did this in Vegas or at like the UFC Apex Center, I would call everyone I knew. I would, I would be texting Rogan. Like I would do everything I could to be there. All right. Um, would I pay for it? Hell yes. Hell yes. <laughs> I mean, and these guys are talking about putting a billion dollars up to charity for the loser. So I'm, I'm all about it, Doug. And then as far as who's going to win, I mean, right now as constituted, Elon Musk is much older. He's out of shape. And Zuckerberg trains. And, he, and even though I think he's a white belt, I don't even think he's a blue belt in jiu-jitsu, but he does train. And having done jiu-jitsu now for well over a decade, I can tell you, you get on the ground with someone who's never wrestled, who's never done any kind of grappling against someone who's had enough jiu-jitsu they're going to absolutely take the fight over. So it's not going to be much of a fight. Um, mm -hmm. But I did enjoy the fact today that um, Elon Musk's mom said, I'm calling the fight off. Boys, need to <laughs> knock it off. So she actually did come out today and said, there'll be no fight. You guys need to knock it off. I thought that was adorable. Yeah, yeah. Well, here's mom coming to the rescue once again. So. Doug, if it's like in, in Vegas or something, we're going. You, me, and Keenan, we're going. Mm -hmm. We're yeah. going. No. <laughs> not interested so anyway all right buddy here's here's my halftime and it's funny because before the show you were showing a magazine about uh your alma mater and that's what my my podcast is about throw that thing up there real quick harvard larry 29 so anyway i'm gonna try to keep this one succinct because i just have i have a college graduate and my daughter is going to be a senior. So I'm on the back end of college and you're on the front end, right? So I don't want to go down a wormhole here with the whole uh, perspective of, of college and what it means and uh, secondary education. But my point with Harvard is that there was a Harvard Business School professor who focuses on behavioral sciences and stuff. I'm not even sure how a business professor and behavioral sciences, to me, those don't seem to mesh very well. But um, this individual is accused of falsifying results on several of her studies over the course of her tenure at, uh, at Harvard. And the funny thing is one of the studies that um, this is alleged to have participated in was actually a study on truthfulness. And it was essentially, it's kind of a cool study. If you make a statement about the, your truthful comments at the top of the page, and then you write a, an essay or answer the, the prompt, or do you answer the prompt and then um, write your name on the bottom that says everything you just said w w was truthful. So that was the um, uh, that was the test or, or the uh, uh, you know the study. So anyway, it was data manipulation. They went in there and made some changes. It's kind of hush hush. So you know, kind of like the, uh, the longshoreman strike. You don't really know what the details are, and Harvard's not going to release that because they don't want to look silly. But um, Anyway, data manipulation, falsification of records. Um, I, I don't know, man. It's just another example of I'm, I'm struggling with the value of a uh, college education in this day and age. I've just gotten through writing checks, and you're about to write the checks. I think kids nowadays, this is my soapbox for 25 seconds. I think that kids nowadays out of post-COVID are probably a little bit immature to jump into the shock value of what it is to go away to college. I think everybody should take a gap year. And I think there's lots of alternative options that are out there. Um, trade schools, things of that nature. And Pete, as you know, I had an, I started an SAT and an ACT prep company and essay writing and the amount of money and the pressure that parents put on these kids to study, 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 to get a grade, to get a number, to take it to the next level is uh, stressful. And so, um, I don't know. Everybody is stressed to make sure they are the, the the top of their game, and one of the you know the preeminent schools in the world, Harvard, you know, has a little Mickey Mouse going on there with uh, you know manipulation of studies and data. So anyway, that's my halftime. I, I, um, there you go. 
Oh, um, make your comments, and then I have one more Casa Bonita update. Oh, God, Casa Bonita, baby. All right, so uh, two, two things about what you said. First of all, I'm, I'm halfway through the college tuition experience. Um, oldest is an architect, went to a state school, did not destroy me financially. Thank you. Yep. Um, oldest daughter, uh, all done. And um, oldest, youngest son, college athlete. So most of that is being paid for. Youngest daughter, artist, God save me. Um, so, and, and as far as the university system goes, I'm Harvard University's worst alumnus because I am not at all impressed with the school. And I, I regularly tell people how it's really nothing but marketing. That I, I've been more impressed by people who went to some state university for their master's degree or undergrad than most of the people I went to Harvard. So, you know, don't be impressed just because you see somebody went to that school. Mm. Now, as far as this cheating scandal goes, I think it's delicious, Doug. I love it. <laughs> so, and here's the reason why. It, Professor Gino is, is famous because of this study. And the way that academic studies work is I write a study, you use my, my findings for my study. So now your study is using information from my study and someone uses your study. And now because I'm famous, everybody wants to co-author things with my study. So now everyone's going to ask, now that I've been found out to be a fraud, everyone's wondering if their studies are a fraud. So she's had this viral, you know, kind of, kind of, um, it's almost like a, like a, like the pandemic, right? Like everything she's touched is in question. And there's a lot of questions as to, was she ever honest? Mm -hmm. Was there any academic honesty? And how can a university like Harvard not have had more oversight in the work she was doing? Easy it was generating money and prestige and it made them look good. So why would they do a whole lot more extra looking over their shoulder at the work when it was benefiting them not to? So mm -hmm. guess what fair, fair um, um, uh, Harvard University, you're getting what you deserve because you are not doing the work academically that you should have been. Um, yeah, don't even, one more thing. <laughs> when I was at this one school with my daughter yesterday, uh, one of the parents said, so how do I find out if the professors are any good here? Are they, are they reviewed? And the student giving the tour, who was wonderful, by the way, um, said, well, you can go on ratemyprofessor.com. That's probably the best way to find out from the students. And they said, so are those, what are those like? I said, well, they're brutally honest, taken from a college professor. They're, they're brutally honest. And uh, the parents said, well, as they should be. I mean, I don't want my daughter taking a class from someone who isn't nice or, you know, gives too much work. Or, and, and I couldn't help myself. And my poor daughter's. <laughs> She hates going on these tours with me. And I said, yes, heaven forbid that the money you're spending on college is not a consumer experience for your daughter. I mean, we wouldn't want her to go somewhere and not just have the most delightful time for the money. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's not here to learn, right? She's here for four years of fun and frivolity. And I mean, you know, the rest of the tour was a little awkward, I'd say, Doug, from that point forward. But um, I'm not generally one to care. So Casa Benita, let me hear about it. Okay, so the first timed entries, like we talked about this, there's timed entries. Um, the 29th is when they're supposed to have, um, you know, the first time entry in the small group. It's not it's open for a few hours on the 29th and then again through the first or something like that. But the big news this week is that there's going to be no tipping and everybody that works there is going to get $30 an hour. Wow. And that's it. Yeah. Yeah. So no tipping. Now, how all that works and the nuances of it and what happens if you want to tip. Um, I, I don't know that, but the big thing is that there is, uh, if you want to work at Casa Bonita, you're going to make 30 bucks an hour, no tips. So, yeah. you know. I don't know. Am I jumping off a cliff for 30 bucks an hour? Because I'll wear the gorilla suit. Yeah. No problem yep. with that. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll, are we going to we'll be see. able to do a show live from Casa Bonita? Can we get Kenan on that and find out if they'd let us? He, he can do some legwork on it, but you know, muggles like you and I aren't going to be able to get in there free willy nilly for uh, for several months unless we want to put our name on a list. And and um, Doug, it's important for the show to have a goal. <laughs> yeah, I think that should be the show's goal: is live from Casa Bonita. It's Global Trade this week. Yes, 
that is the statement that will make uh, 2023 a success. Forget the topics, forget our right or wrong, forget any of our insight. It's If that statement can be made before December 31st, it will be a successful year. Do, do we know if the food's going to be just as absolutely atrocious as it used to be? No, that is a big deal. They're hyping the fact that they got this executive chef. They're limiting the menu to like nine or 10 items, and um, it's supposed to be good. So we'll see. All right. I can't wait. All right. Dress as Cartman, man. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> yeah. All right. So let's shift gears back into uh, the purpose of this show, which is global trade. So take, yeah. take it away on your second topic. So second topic is one that's uh, beginning to come around. So we've been reading a lot about this idea of uh, diver like diversifying, again, diversifying your supply chain, making it more resilient, being a little less uh, at, at, the, at the will and whim of countries that maybe are not as politically aligned with us. And a lot of this comes from what we've learned, the lessons of COVID. Early 90s to mid 90s was the era of hyper-globalization. There's an excellent miniseries I tell everyone to watch called Commanding Heights that was on PBS that really gets into the beginnings of the, the truly global economy, how it started, um, just the real birth of the concept and how it's impacted the world economically. It's a fantastic miniseries. It's based on a wonderful book that won the Pulitzer Prize. The next era of that was this moderation of the global economy, where we all began to create rules about how it was going to work. And many of those rules about how it was going to work came from just a, a common tribal understanding amongst these different nations. You know, don't step on my toes, I won't step on yours. Let's try to find ways to work with one another. It was mostly largely written and, and prescribed by business itself. And from time to time, politics would be interjected but it wasn't, it was, it was this never ceasing feeling that politics was driving a lot of the decisions on trade. Then with the, the Trump administration and COVID, and that's really where the turning point happens. With the Trump administration and COVID, we see um, two very fascinating things begin to happen. First, of course, is the pandemic and our desires as supply chain professionals to make a more diversified, more resilient supply chain that isn't as dependent on one particular region or a small collection of people and places to get our things. And then second of all, this rise of, of trade nationalism, which has come back. It was, it was more or less the case 1970s, early 1980s, that countries were more concerned about where their things came from, and they tried to keep that money at home. We're seeing that again. And maybe if not necessarily at home, close to home. If you're a European country, buy your things from the European Union and the United Kingdom. If you're an American, North American country, if you considered if there's some place you could buy it from within the, the USMCA nations or within Latin America or the Caribbean, or an aligned politically country. So the question now that's beginning to rise is, at what point have we jumped the shark, you know, and how much of what we're seeing now is really more politically driven than financially driven, market driven? Are we becoming more and more diverse because we're being forced to out of political motivation or becoming more and more diverse in our supply chains? because it's the right thing to do from a market perspective. And now that rubber is hitting the road with large corporations saying, we're going to leave some of our production in China, take it to Southeast Asia, take it to Mexico, bring it back home in certain instances. And Chinese companies saying, we're going to keep production in China, regardless of the fact that it might be a little more expensive because it's best for people in China to work. It's better for our brand to have these things here. Um, and then there are governmental concerns about keeping those people working there as well. So I don't know, Doug, it's, it's getting to the point now where I think we're going to see a lot of light shined on just why exactly those decisions are being made because COVID appears to be behind us. And now politics is taking very much a front row seat. Yeah. <clears throat> well, whenever you're saying, is it um, economy or political without, in my opinion, without question, it's political, right? Um, the cohesiveness of a, um, you know, hyper globalized uh, country. There, there, and, and I'll go to the Elon Musk and the Zuckerberg. There has to be a yin and a yang, a protagonist and an antagonist 
there has to be one side or the other. There has to be opposing forces for there to be harmony in the world. And if you rewind the show, there's several instances where we spoke about that, that, uh, you know, you could draw kind of a, a tangent, the Elon Musk and, and, uh, and, and the Zuckerberg thing. There has to be a part A and a part B. So um, the homogeneous and the hyper globalization it sounds good. It's a good soundbite. But, you know, the the bottom line is um, there has to be some level of conflict to have the whole thing work together. And I think COVID was a natural a divider to some degree, right? Divide may be the wrong word, but the separatist nature of it. And so even if it was going to a hyper, hyper globalization and everybody was feeling all kumbaya, COVID just shut that thing down. Everybody, you know, brought back in and they had to protect themselves and things of that nature. Rightfully so. It was a freaking pandemic, right? Um, but to get away from that and get back maybe to where we used to be, I, I don't know if it's going to happen. The politics of it will be front and center. It'll be pushed. But the bottom line is hyperglobalization will be promoted as long as there's a financial gain in it for one party or the other, which again means there's one party or another and there has to be some um, conflict for stability. So I, I don't know if I really answered your question or not, you but did. yeah, so yeah. yeah. And I, I think we're going to see more as time goes on, and we need to start paying attention to this uh, as businesses. I think we'll we'll make more of these decisions than politicians because we're the ones that pay the politicians. Yep. 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 So cool. Well, from from my last topic, right. Here's something that you may not have known. I certainly didn't, but you're a more global, well-versed individual than myself. Did you know the Department of Energy gives out loans? Mm. Yeah, and and uh, uh, well, they do. And they just gave Ford Motor Company uh, in a uh, a 9.2 billion with a B loan uh, to build three EV. Uh, battery factories here in the U.S. It's a combination of Ford and this Korean EV battery company. Um, it, it has a separate name. I can't remember the name of it, but they're going to, I think, build two plants in Kentucky, one in Tennessee, or one in Tennessee and two in Kentucky. So the first thing is, like, I had no clue that Department of Energy was giving loans out uh, of that size and scope, right? Uh, and that's all fine and good, but it, it'll go to another example of how important the um, battery supply chain and the, the EV supply chain that's coming out. We've talked about you're just not planting the materials that, that make the battery, the, you know, the lithium and all of the, the, uh, uh, the minerals that we are for, that, that are not produced here that are being imported from countries all over the place. The supply chain, my whole point with this, Pete, is a supply chain that's going to surround battery manufacturing, which is supporting the electrical the, the electric vehicle industry, which is being heavily promoted by all kinds of players on both sides of the fence, so to speak. Um, the global battery supply chain is going to be very interesting. And I don't think we're ready for it. I think companies say they're ready for it. But when they look at the liability and, oh, by the way, uh, you are brokering an entire aircraft full of batteries that could blow up in the sky. Um, maybe that's a little dramatic, but um, I think the battery supply chain is going to be a big deal. I think we're woefully prepared for it, and it's going to hit us right in the face uh, before we know about it. So I think that topic, maybe a year or two out, is, is going to be a hot topic. I think you'll you'll read about it, but it, it, there's so much money and so much effort and, and so much focus on it is that the supply chain that keeps it moving is woefully unprepared for this explosion, pardon my pun, of what's coming down the road and the need to move these uh, uh, products, commodities, and um, and, and items uh, effectively. Well, I, you're not being dramatic at all, Doug. I, I, one of the most common frustrations for people that move hazardous goods is batteries, just lithium batteries. They're in so many things, and they are a hazardous material that has to be accounted for. Anyone that's ever flown on a plane, they ask you, in your packed luggage, do you have any lithium-ion batteries? Do you have any e-cigarettes? If your bag is with you and you have to check it last minute, they ask you, do you have any mm -hmm. portable batteries in your bag? So it, it it's a concern. And it wouldn't be 
It would be dramatic, Doug, if it weren't for the fact that these things have caught fire on planes. And once they do, the plane doesn't have a shot in hell. So uh, it, it is frustrating. It is scary. It is worrisome. And EVs catch fire. Battery technology is still something that is uh, it's still developing. It leaps and bounds, but it's still developing. And mm -hmm. any developing technology is going to have parts of it that we're still learning about and trying to make safe. The supply chain associated with it has to deal with dangerous goods, but also has to deal with the fact that it's so diverse in the different materials that are used for it. Um, not all of those places that these things come from are necessarily easy to get things from. So there might be stuff coming from it, but not necessarily going to it, which increases the cost, uh, as you well know. And America is going headlong into the idea of EVs without an understanding of just how difficult it is to supply all the raw materials and a real understanding for the inefficiency of gathering those things to make them. Mm -hmm. So Doug, I, I think you're, you're doing a good job of discussing all the different ways that we have to wrestle with this. Um, I'll still be driving a diesel pickup truck probably when it's all over with, but um, yeah. yeah, it's, it's madness. And the government's going to do everything they can to try to speed it along. And if that means loans, means loans. If yeah. that means regulation to make it harder to drive a, a fossil fuel car, we'll do that too. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. It'll be interesting. Our industry is up for a um, uh, interesting dance related to that Everybody. commodity and, and vertical. Yep. All right. Well, that's going to do it for uh, uh, this particular edition of Global Trade this week. Thank you to our sponsors, Cap Logistics, for their unwavering support of the show. Thank you to you for listening and for telling your friends. Please do subscribe. If you're listening to us, subscribe on whatever platform you happen to listen to. And if you watch us on YouTube, know that you can catch us on just about any audio platform for the podcast. Thanks to uh, Keenan back at the booth. Thanks to all of you. And thank you, Doug, as always. Great show. See you all again yeah. next week. Okay. Thanks, Pete.